Everyone, welcome, and uh, and thank you for, for making time to be here today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. As Christy said, I'm the product manager for security operations here at Duo Security uh, within the Cisco Secure Group, um, and I'm really excited to talk about uh, Zero Trust today. Um, and uh, so today, I want to uh, kind of touch on what we're gonna what we're gonna walk through. My intent is to discuss Zero Trust principles and how they can be. Uh, taken advantage of uh, by you within your organization um, and how you can make this a little bit easier on yourself to achieve the security outcomes that you're looking for, as well as the end user experience that you're looking for without a huge amount of uh, development work and requirements on the back end. Um, I also want to talk uh, about access technologies a little bit and discuss some of the benefits uh, to things like multi-factor authentication, uh, single sign-on, passwordless, and continuous trusted access, uh, and then get into a little bit of how you can integrate zero trust into your business. Um, zero trust is a term that gets tossed around quite a bit. Um, and I think that if you ask 10 different people, uh, you might get nine to 15 different answers on what exactly zero trust is. But the way that I view it is that it's a journey for your organization. Um, there's no specific tool you can buy uh, that's going to get you there. Um, it really has to do with the way that your organization works together, the systems that you've built, uh, both information systems, as well as the way that uh, humans work together uh, with each other and with those systems. Um, and so I want to take some time today uh, to talk about the way that we can move on that journey uh, and get you closer to your, your end goals. So uh, just to kick things off, I want to set the stage uh, and, and check in. Um, with the with the with the polling that we've got today, uh, so who here follows all password rules, uh, enjoys doing it, and has never taken a security shortcut for convenience? All right, we've got a lot of people who uh, who are are much better disciplined than I am. Um, and, uh, and are, and are following all the rules. So kudos to you. Um, but we do have, uh, it looks like, um, a, a pretty clear majority of people, uh, take at least some shortcuts, um, or just don't pay attention at all. And I think that the, the reason that I, I wanted to start with that today is because it kind of sets the stage for the way that we approach security here at Duo Security. Um, and it's a kind of a tacit recognition of the fact that um, end user experience and security are directly tied to each other. Um, and they have real impacts on each other. So uh, you can be more secure by making security easier for your end users. Uh, the analogy that I like to use is if you have uh, the best uh, front door lock in the entire world and there's not a thief in the world that can get past it, but it takes you 15 minutes to set the lock on your way out the door in the morning, you're probably going to leave your front door unlocked a little bit more often. And that leaves you in a worse situation overall. Um, and so just because, you know, a certain technology might uh, work well in a certain um, threat profile or against, you know, certain patterns that you see uh, attackers taking advantage of, uh, doesn't mean that it's going to be the best thing for your organization. And if we can approach things from that standpoint, I, we believe that it leaves everyone better off. So I, I just wanted to set the stage with that a little bit. Um, now I want to talk about Lee. So everything that I'm going to tell you about Lee is a fact and uh, it is, is something that I've uh, found from uh, customers in the past couple of months, except for the fact that Lee doesn't exist. Um, so Lee is a compound character um, and so all the little little details about her uh, do exist somewhere in a, a customer's environment. Um, and Lee just got this new job. So she's going to be a support engineer at a wind farm maintenance company. And that means that she has to do a couple of things in her day-to-day -day life just to kind of get through, right? So she needs to travel a lot. She needs to get out to these sites uh, where uh, the wind farms are at. She needs to work with her uh, research and development team. So she gets access to, uh, you know, some sensitive uh, company data um, for their intellectual property. Um, she also sometimes needs to access web applications while she's on the move. 
Uh, and then while she's on site, um, sometimes there are uh, control servers and things like that um, where she needs to access uh, on-premises resources. And so between all of these, um, she just wants to get all on with her day, right? She doesn't want to spend all of her time uh, held up. She wants to be able to get out to do the inspections, to do the impair repairs, um, to do the job that she was hired to do and that she wants to do. And we don't want to hold her back. So uh, she just got hired and this is her first day, right? Uh, I, I think everyone here has been through some version of this. Um, I was just talking to a coworker who just joined the team and uh, is kind of getting used to all the resources that we've got here uh, internally at Duo. And uh, it can be overwhelming, right? Just finding out where's the information that you need uh, and, and, and what do I need to pay attention to and what does my boss care about and who are my coworkers and what am I supposed to do this week? That's overwhelming just as it is. Uh, but if you add on top of that, all of this uh, complexity uh, to try to you know, maintain a strong security posture, it can get really overwhelming. And uh, it, this is, again, kind of tying back to that idea uh, that if you make end user uh, experience better, uh, you can come out to a more secure outcome. If you ask Lee on her first day at work uh, to make a very secure, uh, very complicated, very unique password for every single one of these uh, resources that she's going to need to get into on a regular basis, she's probably going to end up doing something like writing them all down in a notebook or copying and pasting them or making them, you know, small variations of one another. And we don't want that. That's a bad security outcome for the company. It leaves them in a, a bad position. Um, and it's also a really, you know, miserable experience for Lee on her first day while she's got a lot of other things that are on her mind. So I want to talk about what a better experience could be. Um, and and so uh, we start here uh, looking at all the people who are involved in Lee's first day. So Lee got uh, hired by her hiring manager, um, who again, uh, needed someone to help out in that role, right? And they, they don't wanna spend all their time uh, getting things set up for that person and uh, you know working on paperwork and everything else. They wanna do what they're there to do. Um, and uh, so if we can make it easy for that manager to click a button or just a couple of buttons and, and then everything else flows for Lee from that point, that's a much better experience for Lee's hiring manager. For Lee, if she just needs to make one account and then she has access to everything, uh, that's a lot more convenient. And then finally, for the administrative team who set this all up on the back end, um, if everything works together, if all of these uh, resources and web applications are using uh, common access technologies, um, then they can all be unified in one area. They can be managed easier. Uh, policy can be applied against them in a much more simple way. Um, and they're going to get a lot less help tickets uh, coming from people like the hiring manager and Lee herself uh, because people just aren't going to be getting as confused. So in this situation, uh, Lee's hiring manager uh, files a ticket saying, hey, uh, Lee did great on the interview process and we'd really love to hire her. She just accepted the offer. So let's get that moving and on board her. That sinks into the company's identity provider. Um, and at that point, Duo picks it up from there and then federates it out and gives Lee access, protected access, to all of these applications uh, that she needs to have access to in order to do her day job. From Lee's perspective, this is really easy. She gets an email to enroll through Duo. She conducts that. She's got her company-issued laptop, which has the device help application on it. And so uh, Duo is able to uh, pick up on device telemetry there and ensure that there are um, the, the proper controls uh, that the uh, company has enacted in their unified policy engine. Uh, and then enroll on uh, her mobile phone. And all of a sudden, she's got access to everything she needs. Um, so that was a, a secure uh, process for her. This was a multi-factor uh, process. Um, and now she has this convenient access uh, where everything is in one spot and she's able to just move on with her day.
Um, and so she doesn't have to spend a lot of time doing this. She's able to spend the rest of her time uh, doing what she wants to do, onboarding, learning with her co uh, coworkers, uh, jumping in and, and starting to solve problems instead of getting tied down in some of this administrative stuff. So I want to take a, a pause here. Um, and this is an open response, but, um, you know, we've got a lot of different cybersecurity threats out there in the world right now. Um, and I just wanted to uh, kind of open up for a second and see what's on people's minds. So um, we can kind of uh, shape some of the rest of the discussion today based on uh, what your concerns are. So please uh, fire away with, with whatever thoughts you've got and, and uh, what, what's top of mind for you. I'll pause here for a second. All right. Um, so this is uh, fantastic. This is um, a lot of things uh, that are top of mind for us here at Duo. Um, and so it seems like we're all in the right place because we've got a lot of similar concerns. Um, so I'm just going to kind of, you know, uh, pick up on a couple of the themes here that I'm seeing today. Uh, so ransomware, uh, RBAC, risk-based access control, HEPCAC, a uh, problem exists between uh, Compute or between sharing and, and keyboard, um, malware, uh, hacked accounts, phishing, MFA fatigue, uh, and data loss. Um, and so these are uh, a lot of the things that we're talking about on a day-to-day -day basis here at Duo. And uh, what we've noticed in the industry over the past decade, 15 years, is that as uh, a lot of... Um, organizational tools have centered around identity and access management tools or, or platforms, um, that's become a much more appealing target uh, to um, bad actors and uh, people who are trying to get access who, who shouldn't have access. So there's a whole conversation that we could have about uh, motivations there and, and trends that we've seen um, in, in some cybersecurity um, uh ransomware groups, initial access brokers, um, advanced per persistent threats. Um, but the net story comes down to the fact that uh, a lot of uh, attacks are coming through the identity layer. And it makes sense, right? If I can uh, pick up on, you know, Joe uses a, a bad password policy, he repeats his passwords, um, he makes his passwords easy to guess, um, then, you know, if I've got access to uh, you know, important uh, company resources to do uh, the course of my day job, then it becomes a very appealing uh, place to attack. And so that's what we want to uh, try to enable you uh, to protect yourself against. So ransomware is something that I want to uh, kind of uh, take a second to to call out here. Um, what we what we study here um, with uh, the algorithm uh, threat detection team um, within Duo, is one of the things that we look at is uh, the route that attackers take uh, to execute a ransomware attack. Um, and what we find is that there are a couple of uh, initial entry points that are pretty common. Um, there's a couple of different ways that uh, bad actors will spread through a network um, and get access to resources once they have that initial access. Um, sometimes there's a you know an element of persistence there um, and uh, defense evasion, um, but Ultimately, uh, they're trying to do the same thing, right? Um, is is getting to ransomware, and we, we've noticed trends that have changed recently there um, in in the manner of extortion. But none of them are good for the organization uh, that's fallen victim to this. And so we've put a lot of thought into this and the ways that we can protect organizations that are going to be ransomware targets uh, from that initial access. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we communicate with the rest of the security stack. Um, to enable you to uh, protect from a couple of different uh, initial access vectors. Um, there's also, you know, a couple of the other things that got brought up here, hacked accounts, phishing, MFA fatigue, uh, and, and data theft. Um, again, a lot of these are coming through the same vectors. Um, and then I, I do want to take a second. So PEPCAC, uh, problem exists between um, chair and keyboard. Um, this is going back to the same uh, point that I made earlier uh, about, you know, if we can make it easy for end users to make the right decisions, if we can make it easy uh, for, for everyone in the organization to kind of default to a more secure state, it's going to be a lot better for the organization as a whole. 
Um, and we think that we can empower end users to have a better experience uh, while also coming out to an improved security posture for the organization. So that was really helpful. Thank you, everyone, uh, for, for helping out there. Um, and uh, again, you know, I was, I was mentioning that I think it's uh, kind of good that we're all here in the same space uh, because um, these were some of the things that you, that you brought up. Um, and so what we want to do here um, is understand these patterns. Um, so here at Dubo, uh, we put a great amount of effort into staying abreast of the latest uh, trends and patterns and attack types. Uh, we respond uh, to them in the way that we are prioritizing our product development. We work very closely across Cisco uh, and uh, understand um, reports that come out of uh, Talos um, and uh, our, our intelligence uh, community here. Um, and then we also want to contribute back to the community. So uh, we have researchers who are contributing to, um, to MITRE. Uh, we've got a lot of folks who have come from CSUT. Um, and we want to make sure that we're, we're staying um, plugged in to the entire uh, cybersecurity uh, industry and, and community uh, to make sure that we can learn these developments and these trends uh, so that we can improve the product for our customers. The net effect here is that it is a very dynamic environment. There are a lot of things happening all the time, um, and it is very difficult to stay uh, uh, current with, with what's happening. Um, and so this is hard enough as a security practitioner, uh, but if you also have to then, you know, build these detections, build these responses, build these tools, maintain everything, manage all of your vendors, it gets a lot more difficult. And so uh, we view our responsibility here at Duo as uh, staying abreast of these and improving our product against these uh, threats um, in order to, to provide a better service for you uh, so that we can take uh, some of these insights apply them and bring that into the product. So uh, in a little bit, I'll talk about uh, some of the recent developments we've had um, within uh, the Duo uh, environment and, and how those have responded to uh, some of these um, more recent threats. So this is Ollie. Um, and Ollie is uh, the attacker that I, I, I mentioned a little bit before. Um, and, uh, if, if you've been, um, staying, uh, you know, in, involved here, uh, in, in some of the same communities that we have, um, Ollie is always adapting the way that he is, uh, trying to, uh, attack people, right? Um, every single week, there's a new, uh, malware report out. In fact, saying every single week is not doing it justice. There is, it's a lot more common than that. Um, they're evolving constantly. Uh, because attackers are always playing this cat and mouse, um, and cat and mouse game uh, with uh, malware detection systems and antivirus systems. Uh, and the uh, attackers try something and the defenders uh, catch on to that. And then the attackers try something new and vice versa. And we see the same thing here in the identity world. Um, and one of the things that uh, we put a lot of effort into is trying to understand how we can differentiate Ollie from Lee and how we can drive signal uh, from the way that access uh, attempt is happening. And so I wanna talk a little bit here about uh, Lee, Lee's example specifically, right? So one of the more common uh, signals that people will look to for access management is IP address. And uh, you know there are a lot of companies out there um, that, have, that will publish IP reputation services, um, there's a lot of ISPs out there that will publish uh, location uh, information. And so you can get, uh, you know, kind of updates like, hey, uh, you know, you're accessing from Ann Arbor. The last time that you tried to access was in New York City. Is this really you? Uh, what does this look like? Um, and in a, in, a, in a world where everyone is working in the office every single day and uh, you're on a standard network, um, and, you know, maybe there's, uh, you know, for a larger company like Cisco, you're backhauling traffic um, into, you know, specific areas. Uh, you get a little bit of nuance, but really not too much. And there's a lot of static uh, um, behavior there, and it's very predictable. Um, and so in those times, uh, IP could be a great signal uh, for geolocation, which could be a great signal for trust. 
Uh, today's day and age, it's a little bit different. Um, and we see this happening all of the time, right? So Lee, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, is always traveling. Um, and so is it unusual that Lee is accessing from this new location? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, and it's difficult to uh, discern between Lee and Ollie um, in a lot of ways. And so we put a lot of effort here uh, into driving signal um, from the telemetry that we are able to, uh, from the telemetry that happens uh, through um, the authentication uh, process uh, and, and driving signal out of that um, so that we can improve the way that we are uh, delivering enrichment to our customers. So for example, uh, we have recently released um, two features that I want to talk about a little bit here. So the first is um, risk-based access and, um, excuse me, uh, risk-based authentication. And so what we've done with risk-based authentication we, is we've uh, studied um, a lot of the uh, known positive events. So uh, customers have come to us and said, hey, this access was not, uh, not legitimate. Um, and so we, we, we take that, we ingest that data, and we look at patterns that we can pull out of this. Um, so for some things like MFA fatigue, um, we're able to drive a lot of signal out of that and apply that in real time uh, to uh, require a remediation uh, to an authentication factor that is uh, more phishing resistant. Um, and so that's uh, been the genesis for Verified Push um, in which uh, we require an end user to number match. So we're able to drive this uh, strong balance between the end user experience where uh, Lee is not getting prompted all the time. Uh, we're able to mute things if uh, you know we detect that there's an attack going on. Um, however, we're also still able to grant access um, in a more secure manner uh, without driving a help desk ticket, without um, you know creating extra effort um, either for Lee or for the administrative team. Um, and then there's uh, another uh, feature that I want to mention is uh, registration threat detection. And so understanding uh, what it looks like when an end user is adding a, an authentication device, what looks like normal and what looks like malicious behavior. Um, there are a number of signals that we're able to drive from that. Um, and we've done a lot of work to uh, cut down on false positive alerting. Um, and so we are really excited about that as well. Um, the net effect from this, though, is that those are difficult things to do. And we've got a really great research team here. Um, we've got a lot of uh, great, great experts uh, who know just, uh, you know, a, a fantastic amount about the domain. Uh, but it's still very difficult to do. And so, uh, especially in a world where end users are um, out there uh, conducting new behavior all the time, replacing their devices all the time, moving, traveling, uh, getting new jobs or, you know, promotions or lateral transfers or whatever it may be, where they're accessing new resources that, that might not be expected. Um, there's just a ton of noise out there. And so we want to be able to drive that signal for you, uh, both to enforce on that, um, as well as to inform you for that. So that brings me to uh, a, a really common um, dynamic that we see within our, our customers' environments where uh, Duo is very often purchased and managed by the identity and access management team. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, we, we, we plug and play with um, IDPs really well. Um, and, 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 and that's, you know, kind of how we've, we've set things up uh, to, to get out into the market. Um, but what we notice is that security operations teams increasingly need to understand what's happening um, in the identity world. Um, you know, we, we, we put that poll out a little earlier about, you know, cybersecurity threats that people are um, concerned about. And, you know, if I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my notes here, uh, you know, I haven't done a, 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 you know, scientific analysis on this, but I would bucket just about everything um, that came through there as uh, something to do with identity security. And so uh, this, this interplay between the security operations team and their ability to constantly monitor uh, to understand what's happening in the environment and remediate that has to happen uh, through an interaction with the identity and the identity and access management team. 
um, not just in the, the technologies that they use, but also the people uh, who are there. And so I, as the product manager for security operations, uh, this is where my role sits, and I get really excited about talking about this um, because we're able to take uh, the uh, behavior that's happening uh, in the end user experience, aggregate that up across the entire organization, drive signal from that, and drive enrichment from that, and then bring that information into the security operations team. So whether they're using um, a SIM for their, their or a SOAR or an XDR or all of the above, uh, we want to make sure that we can take uh, Duo's information and telemetry and get it to the security operations team in an easy to integrate way uh, that drives a lot of signal for them um, and then improve their their experience. So um, we put we put a lot of effort into that, and I think that that's an important piece of, uh, of what I want to talk about today. I'll get a little bit more into the details of uh, some of our APIs and the way that we go about that in, in a minute here. Um, but I also want to take a second to talk about a couple of uh, specific um, features that we have. Um, and, you know, I've been talking about the identity layer all day um, and how uh, it's important to understand uh, end user behavior and what um, access they need and what policy you're trying to apply to them. And humans are, you know, unusual. We are, uh, there's a lot of variants. We, we are not robots. We're always doing something new, something unusual. Uh, and so it, it is important to study the identity layer in and of itself, but it's impossible to separate that completely from the device layer, right? Um, if I'm trying to access information resources at work, um, I'm not doing that out of thin air. I'm doing that through the laptop that's sitting right next to me or the cell phone that's happening or that that's on the other side of me. Um, and so because of that, that intimate relationship, uh, we want to be able to provide device trust. We we put a lot of effort into this. So we're constantly making updates to our mobile application, which is probably what a lot of folks are most familiar with, um, to improve the way that we can uh, drive a trusted signal uh, from that. So a uh, very common one, uh, you know, we, we were, we're always seeing this pattern of a new vulnerability gets announced and then vendors patch it um, and then we want to make sure that we are up to date on that latest patch, right? Like how many times have you uh, gone to um, access something on an app that you haven't used in a while and it says, hey, you need to update or, uh, you know, you, you go to use your phone and it says, hey, you've got an update. You really, really should do this. Uh, like this is a serious one. Um, and we, we know that uh, our, our security teams um, and our IT teams um, at all of our, our customers are concerned about this, right? Because if my uh, mobile phone or if my laptop are compromised by malware, um, then it doesn't matter, you know, what kind of controls you do to make sure that I'm the one accessing uh, if, if my device can't be trusted in the first place. So from the mobile standpoint, uh, we're, we're constantly iterating on uh, the mobile app, but we also have uh, a lot of things, a lot of tools that are available um, for uh, endpoint management. So uh, the device health application um, gives you a lot of ability to understand what's happening on someone's device and is the posture uh, established in the way that you want it to be. So is a firewall enabled? Is the operating system up to date? Is uh, their, um, their browser up to date? Um, and uh, do they have encryption? For physical security risk, do they have a password or are they using biometrics? And we want to uh, enable you uh, to establish your policy uh, based on all these factors. So all of our customers are different and some of them have very different requirements, right? Uh, for some folks, uh, biometrics might be a very, very important control because that's part of their threat model. For Lee, maybe she's got to use her laptop with gloves on sometimes. And so that's not part of it at all. Um, sometimes location controls are really, really important to folks. They know that uh, information should never be leaving a specific building or a sport sp specific region. Um, for other folks, uh, we know that travel is really, really expected and normal and, and part of uh, normal business operations. Um, but the intent here is that uh, we're able to drive uh, device trust um, through these developments and work with other vendors um, and receive signal from them and make sure that if you've got an XDR or an EDR or an MDM, 
um, we are able to, to pull a signal from that and you're able to enforce policy the way that you want to enforce policy. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we understand that the, the relationship there, um, is kind of intractable and you, and you can't pull that apart. I also want to talk about passwordless for a second here. Um, and there's, there's two pieces, uh, to passwordless that are, are you know, I, I, I get really excited about. We often talk about how end user experience and security are in tension with each other or, you know, kind of opposed to each other. Um, but in, in a passwordless sense, um, you can drive the very best user experience with fantastic security controls at the same time. Um, and again, this is, you know, in a, a part of the importance of uh, vendors in the security space working together uh, because none of this is possible without operating systems working directly with browsers, working directly with um, authentication systems. Uh, the FIDO2 Alliance, um, CTAP2, and WebAuthn uh, are all some of these uh, you know, organizations and um, standards uh, that wouldn't be possible without a lot of control. Um, but what we get excited about with, with passwordless is the fact that um, as uh, biometrics um, and uh, platform authenticators and roaming authenticators have become ubiquitous. So this this hardware is getting out into the world, right? YubiKeys are a lot more common than they used to be. Um, it's, you know, you, you might you may find it difficult to buy a new cell phone these days uh, that doesn't have any type of uh, biometric capabilities. Uh, laptops increasingly have them. Um, you know, Windows and Apple are both offering uh, their versions of these uh, between Windows Hello and, and, and Touch ID. Um, and so we find this, uh, you know, is, is increasingly possible and achievable for customers. Um, and we want to support that. Um, so in this kind of a scenario, uh, Lee doesn't have to think about a password all the time. Um, but more importantly, uh, by using uh, WebAuthn authenticators, um, Lee becomes very phishing resistant. Um, and a lot of those, uh, you know, um, security best practices, like, hey, make sure you read the URL and make sure that it's familiar to you. Um, make sure that um, the HTTPS uh, connection is working and you see that little lock symbol for yourself. Um, sometimes people don't have time for that. Um, and sometimes they, 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 they don't follow, uh, you, know, you know, best details there. Um, but with passwordless, uh, you know, we, we remove that responsibility. Uh, we allow uh, the uh, platform authenticator or the, the roaming authenticator um, to do that for you um, to verify, uh, you know, the, the source domain for the authentication request. Um, and so Lee doesn't have to think about that at all. Um, Lee just says, I need to get into my resources. I'm going to put my fingerprint on the fingerprint scanner and boom, I'm in. Um, so we want to support that and we want to support customers um, as they're trying to integrate this further and further and further into their, excuse me, further into their environment. So this is um, the way that we are looking at zero trust. So I, you know, I mentioned that zero trust is a journey um, and that's exactly how we see it for our customers. It's also how we see it for our own product development. And these are the things that we want to enable for Lee. So uh, Lee starts with user, uh, user authentication. Um, Risk-based authentication, as I mentioned earlier, is looking off at all of those uh, signals that we have available at time of authentication request, bouncing that against all of the research that we've done into um, known attack patterns, um, and then granting access at the right level. Then we want to look at that uh, session trust and understand, you know, how, how have things changed? Um, has uh, Lee's uh, trustedness changed? Has, have we gotten a new signal from one of the other, um, you know, parts of your uh, security stack um, that might change the, the access that you want Lee to have? Um, and while all of this is happening, Lee's just got a pretty seamless experience. Lee, you know, uses uh, passwordless um, authentication, gets in, and doesn't really have to think about anything. Um, and at the same time, you don't have to think about anything because we're not driving help desk tickets to your, um, to your desk. We're, you know, trying to remediate uh, in line, help Lee self-remediate if there's, for example, uh, she accidentally turned her firewall off and that's part of your policy that you're trying to enforce. 
Um, and so we want to enable you to apply zero trust principles uh, where you're at and help in, uh, empower you uh, to move further along towards your zero trust goals. So I'll pause here for a second um, and check in about what kind of access technologies you're most interested in. We can um, talk about this a little bit more uh, as we move forward here. I'll pause for a second. All right, so we've got uh, a bunch of great responses here. Um, and uh, it, I'm, I'm chuckling a little bit because there's, there's so much variety. Uh, I got a couple of responses uh, asking to talk more about VPNs. I also got a couple of responses asking about moving away from VPNs. Um, and so uh, it just kind of goes to show uh, that there's a huge variance in the way that uh, everyone's got their environment set up and we want to be able to uh, to help you um, to help you uh, start where you're at and get where you're trying to go to. Um, so I'll start with VPN for a second, um, and uh, I, I want to talk about that because uh, it's been you know a, a very common trend um, for a lot of companies uh, as the pandemic hit was uh, moving to you know from all resources are contained uh, only you know kind of metaphorically within the walls of the, uh, of the company building, um, to all of a sudden, uh, you know, there, there, there needed to be this quick shift, uh, to enable workers to work remotely, work from home. Uh, and VPN was a, a you know, a great solution to that. It, it, it it's kind of a, a plug and play in, in, in many scenarios, um, where you can still run a lot of things on prem, uh, but give remote access to that. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed is, uh, as we, you know, study breach reports and, and try to understand attack patterns, um, is that a VPN is a really common target. And so we want to be able to, to help you, uh, protect that. And it's very common, uh, that, uh, one of the first, uh, integrations that new customers for Duo, um, covered is their VPN, uh, for example, exactly that reason, um, because it, 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 you know, there, there's so much, um, there, there's so much information there. There's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just a really uh, juicy target for, for, for lack of a better phrase. Um, and so we, we do, we, 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 we work with, um, all types of authentication types, um, radius, um, and, you know, uh, other, uh, you know, legacy, um, VPN type, or excuse me, legacy, uh, auth types, um, that are common among VPNs. We also see a lot of customers who are trying to get away from VPNs. Um, and for, you know, one reason or another, um, whether that's driven by budgetary reasons or architectural reasons or security reasons, um, they're trying to get away from it. And so, uh, that's why we put a lot of development into, um, other technologies. Uh, we've worked, uh, for cloud-based environments. Um, we've, we've put a lot of work into, uh, the SSO, the single sign-on, um, that, that Duo has available. And uh, we've seen that drive uh, huge improvements for our customers who have adopted it. Um, and so we're continuing to uh, expand that program. Um, we've got uh, new new team members coming in um, and we've got you know a lot of investment and a lot of excitement there um, in, on, on that side of the business. Um, and we're also working across the rest of, rest of Cisco uh, because, because we recognize that this is not just a point solution, right? Um, so we also had uh, a, a couple of answers about um, SASE, uh, Secure Access Ser Service Edge. Um, we've had some some questions about um, SD WAN um, and uh, uh, federated access uh, and, and, and a couple of others um, along those lines. And so uh, I, I do want to make sure that we we keep moving here so that we have time for Q and A. Um, but we're working, uh, closely with the rest of Cisco, um, uh, to make sure that your, uh, your, your, your networking options, uh, work for you, um, and that we are providing, uh, that unified, uh, you know, approach, uh, so that the end user has one strong experience, um, but we're able to protect you and, and give you, um, support throughout the entirety of your environment. So I want to take a second here, um, to talk about, uh, how this ends up looking, um, from the, uh, administrative standpoint. Um, and one of the things that we, uh, try to really pay attention to is the fact that there's, there's no part of the security stack that can work, um, in isolation. 
And if we have, uh, if we're, if, if we're building locks and, and, you know, back to my metaphor about the, the front door lock, um, it doesn't matter if that's the best in the world. If your security guard doesn't even know that there's a front door or if the window is unlocked, right? So, uh, we want to make sure that this works with the rest of your environment. There's two pieces to this, um, that I want to take a second to talk about. And the, the first part is the security environment. Um, and the second part is, uh, your, um, your workforce management and your productivity environment. Um, and all of these things, you know, I, I, I kind of threw a lot onto this slide and, and, and just kind of, you know, bullets here and there. Um, but what the, the, the point that I'm trying to emphasize is that we give you a lot of flexibility and we want to support this. So it's a, it's a highly maintained IP, API. Um, and, uh, I want to take a second here, um, to kind of like zoom in on a couple of things that this is enabled for, uh, for some of our customers. Um, so all of these are, are, you know, real, uh, um, examples. I've obviously not put, uh, customer names up here. Um, but I, just a couple of examples to kind of like drive home this idea of, you know, how flexible we are and, and how, uh, we want to make this, we want to enable you, uh, to integrate duo with the rest of your business. So we've got a major consulting company, uh, that uses the admin API with Workday so that all new user enrollment is a self-service process, uh, on an employee's first day and it's synced directly to their active directory. Um, and so, uh, this again is, uh, you know, removing effort from not just Lee, uh, who is, you know, excited to be onboarding and, and excited about the first day, uh, but also Lee's manager, uh, Lee's IT team, uh, Lee's help desk team, making sure that, uh, you know, the, the ongoing work of, uh, of, of the onboarding process is manageable to all of those groups. Um, there's another, uh, customer we've got major networking company uses the admin API with its workforce directory. Um, so that managers are able to issue remediation help, uh, in the event of a lost phone or a broken device. Again, you know, this is something that comes up some relatively often. Um, you know, people drop their phone, they lose their phone. It gets, uh, you know, they forget about it and they go swimming and, and it's in their pocket. Um, and so, uh, you know, depending on, on how they've established um, their, their system, they may not have a backup authentication method and you don't want to just open that to the world. Uh, but it can also drive up help desk, uh, costs. And so, uh, this, this company has, uh, um, brought, uh, the, the, the management team and the org structure into that, uh, to enable a, a faster, easier, less expensive remediation. Uh, there's also a computing company that used the admin API to issue and assign YubiKey authenticators. Uh, to specific employees and then track them uh, through their lifetime. So we strongly support and encourage uh, the adoption of uh, WebAuthn, um, and and YubiKey is a, a great example of that. So we support that, um, and and we we love uh, seeing seeing our customers uh, implement that in their environments. Um, but you know the the addition of a of a physical device that you need to manage, um, you know, creates uh, you know. Uh, a, a process for that, um, in, in the customer's environment. Um, and so we want to support that. And again, uh, back to the admin API, uh, it, it gives you a lot of flexibility to make this work in your environment the way you need it to. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, there's, um, a really tight relationship between, uh, you know, some banks and, and their, their close clients. Um, and so this bank has, uh, you know, approached this in a way, uh, very similar to what we see with some other customers in, um, vendor management and in contractor management and in temporary access management, uh, where they still have access to, uh, you know, some sensitive areas. And so the, the, the customer, uh, brings them in, um, under their, um, their, uh, identity and access management, um, platform. Uh, and so it, it, uh, still gives that, you know, kind of white glove, great, uh, you know, client facing, um, branded experience. Um, for their customers. Uh, so I mentioned a couple of big companies, but I want to drive home the fact that uh, it's not just big companies doing this. Um, and just last month, I, I pulled the records for this earlier this week. Uh, we had more than 40,000 customers using APIs in the past month, and a huge number of them were very small companies. And so um, we, we, we really pride ourselves on making this um, flexible, and extensible 
and uh, something that can support um, you know companies of, of all size and all resources. Um, so at this point, uh, I've been talking to you for for quite some time. I want to pause here uh, and open up for questions and just ask you, what do you want to learn about Zero Trust? What can we talk about? Uh, my colleague, Mike Rotar is here um, and he's just got a, a wealth of information. Uh, so we want to open it up to uh, a, a question and answer type of uh, format. And uh, thank you so much uh, for coming today. Yeah, we, we definitely see a few questions in the chat that we want to address. So, um, you know, first thing uh, is Duo integrated with Talos for threat intelligence? I know this is being investigated today to a certain extent. Joe, do you know anything from the product side as far as as progress or updates on that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, there's, uh, I'm gonna interpret that question in two ways. One is, are we integrated in that we're working together? Um, and two, are we integrated in that we are sharing data and um, you know driving like threat intelligence um, in a programmatic way across our environment? Um, and the answer to both is yes. So we've been uh, working with uh, Talos uh, increasingly. Um, Talos has done just you know phenomenal work. Uh, you know if you don't follow their blog, I really highly recommend it. Uh, they do a great job. They bring a lot of um, really phenomenal research. Um, and 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 I really just I, I I have a huge appreciation for how well they explain things. Uh, you know so they 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 dive into these really really technical forensic investigations. Um, and they come away with these great reports that are so well written. But the other piece of this is, uh, yes, we, we're in the process of, uh, of uh, driving Talos intelligence um, into Duo. So Duo has historically maintained relationships with uh, several third parties uh, for things like some of our, uh, supporting some of our features like um, anonymous system network detection, um, uh, Tor exit node detection, um, anonymous IP and, you know, kind of like third party VPN, uh, use, uh, as well as, uh, you know, as simple as, uh, geolocation. Um, and so we've been working, uh, hard, uh, to coordinate, um, our efforts with Talos. Um, and we're excited to see how that's going to play out in the, in the near future, um, to improve, uh, product performance. Um, and it goes both ways and, 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 and making sure that we're able to, uh, to drive intelligence to Talos as well. Great response, Joe. So I'll take this one. Uh, if an attacker uses VPN to match their target's location, can this be detected by SecOps? So I'm going to tell a little story, but Duo knew going into RBA that we wanted to focus on a new signal that was created with, with a focus on privacy and reliability, right? We know that other solutions that are reliant strictly on IP address, you know, kind of prove our reasoning. You know, there's just inherent challenges with IP address. It can be spoofed. You could be on a corporate network. You could be on an anonymous browser. You could be on a VPN. Leads to false positives and just generally be a burden to a security team, right? And you're not going to assess risk in real time strictly based on an IP address. That's just not possible. So what it what Duo did was, well, if we log into our Wi-Fi network. And we can see a list of your neighbor's Wi-Fi networks. That's a pretty stable predictor and indicator of location change, right? Dual takes that da data, we anonymize it, right? So we don't actually know where the person is located and we compare it to past Wi-Fi fingerprint data for that user. We use those two data points and we determine if a location changed without ever actually knowing that location. That helps us strengthen the signal and know if this is a potential to where we need to step up authentication or, you know, in the future, potentially block that authentication. But I hope that answers that question from chat. Okay, we have another one here. Um, Joe, let's talk about making zero trust easy for end users. Do you have any thoughts on making zero trust easy for end users? I have a few thoughts, but I'd love to hear what you say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, I think that um, 
the 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 strongest goal uh, that uh, that I would you know kind of put out there is that these passwordless authenticators uh, that we've seen uh, you know driving more and more adoption um, are phenomenal opportunities. Um, so that's a really really good opportunity um, because of the channel binding, because of the organ origin binding uh, that's innate to that technology. It's an extremely secure authentication method. And, um, you know, I use it every day at work. Uh, it's really convenient uh, to just, you know, use your fingerprint and, and move on with your day. So that's one thing. Um, we also recommend a uh, single sign-on where possible. Um, and this does a lot of, uh, you know, gives you um, a, a much more uh, seamless end user experience. Um, and we're, we're constantly working on that to expand um, the coverage. And, and, and making sure that you can get more and more of your environment into the SSO. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, we, we put a lot of work into, for example, with the device health application, um, we want to uh, improve uh, an end user's ability to self-remediate. So um, not all end users are staying up to date on, hey, there's a new patch for my operating system, or, uh, you know, hey, I need to make sure that my browser is updated my firewall is turned on, et cetera. And so we put a lot of effort into making sure that not only are we helping you as the administrative team enforce the policy that you need uh, for your given threat model for your environment, we're also helping the end user uh, to work within that. So giving them updates like, hey, you turned off your firewall and that's why you're not able to get access right now. Hey, you've got two weeks before your uh, your employer is gonna start enforcing um, you know, this new requirement for uh, an updated uh, operating system. Um, and so those are a couple of things that that, that come to mind for me. Uh, Mike, if you've got anything else, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, most definitely. I think that was a great response. You covered a lot of the, the similar areas I would touch base on, but I think also one thing to throw in is like flexible device trust, right? Not everybody is going to want the MDM client, you know, installed on their personal device. How do you handle those scenarios? How do you check posture, deep posture? I'm not talking about what your browser gives off when you go to a website. I'm talking about granular uh, builds for your operating system, your browser, right? I'm talking about actually verifying trust of the device that's owned, right? Maybe you're uploading a few identifiers to, to help validate, or if it's a company-owned device, right? You can verify trust through a third-party MDN. Uh, those types of solutions are very effective against low-hanging fruit attacks. Um, you know, you mentioned user self-remediation. I mean, that's walking a user through issues that takes, that alleviates, you know, a help desk burden, right? Immediately told, oh, I got to update my OS before I log in. Well, I can take care of that without calling the help desk because Duo told me. That's something that our, uh, a lot of the market has not really uh, grappled with yet. Uh, user and device posture, right? I mentioned granular browser and operating system controls. And then we also have our new product, risk-based authentication, which is adaptive, right? It's going to work in real time and it's based on a strong signal, right? Like I mentioned in chat, we're looking at Wi-Fi fingerprint, plus location, plus known attack patterns, plus device signals. It's just a beautiful thing. When you couple that with easy to deploy and simple to use policy, you know, the admins have to be able to deploy the technology, right? Effectiveness, right? We actually need to be able to put this in place and see that it's usable in the wild. And that's something that can be, be said about our software today. Um, on top of things like uh, our authentication logging and our easy to digest UEBA tool, Trust Monitor, right? These are things that we can look at, you know, admins can look at and help quickly identify problems, whether that's uh, device insights and things of that nature. You know, one thing, just I'm rambling a little bit here, but I want to highlight this, but. Verizon's 2022 data breach report really highlighted four attack vectors, credentials, phishing, exploit vulnerability, and botnet, botnet attacks. If you can't actually deploy software to protect those four vectors, you're going to be, you know, prone to low hanging fruit attacks and be vulnerable. So just wanted to definitely highlight that. 
So let's see if we have any more questions here. Uh, is it possible to add MFA to Azure AD login? Yeah, I mean, most definitely we can protect uh, Azure through conditional access today. Uh, we have a custom control that can be added. You can add granular policy to that. Um, you know, we could also federate N365 to Duo SSO, right? And get that ease of policy right in Duo, right? Where you're federating uh, your collaboration to email tools directly to our SSO product and able to deploy that simple to use trust policy or remediation policy, posture, etc. Let's see, we have another one as well. Uh, what one product of Cisco or Unified Solution is there? One that we can use to support the Zero Trust campaign we want to. Any thoughts on that one, Joe, before we wrap up? Uh, it's, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, of course, I, I, my, my, uh, my instinct is to say duo um, because we put a lot of focus onto that and, and making sure that we, we support our, our customers there. In all honesty, you know, we, we, uh, again, we, we, we do view um, Zero Trust as a journey, um, one that we want to uh, enable for our customers. And, uh, you know, there's no one uh, tool you can buy uh, or vendor you can uh, subscribe to that's going to deliver that for you. Um, but we do believe uh, that if you take advantage of um, some of these um, architectures that we try very hard to support, such as uh, single sign-on, such as uh, MFA, uh, you know, across your environment, such as improved um, uh Authentication uh, evaluation, such as like like RBA and and all the telemetry that we're assessing that that Mike's been um, Mike's been pointing out. Um, we do believe uh, that that is a, a great way to uh, to point you on the on the zero past zero trust uh, path and and improve your outcomes. Um, so with that, uh, I do want to turn it over to Christy, um, who's got a, a couple of notes on um, what's up next. Uh, but I just wanted to thank everyone so much uh, for your time and uh, for coming out. This has been a, a really wonderful experience. So thank you so much.